Jeff, you've got a lot of applause from an over full house. Oh my goodness, awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you for coming to the screening. I'm glad you enjoyed the film. Um, love to talk through, answer any questions you might have. Uh, I really want to make this part of your your conversation to the audience. So if you do, if you'd like to answer ask questions or have comments, just come down to the microphones at the at the bottom of the stage and kind of turn up and face the booth. That's where the camera is. So that's how Jeff will. Uh, be able to see you and speak to you. So uh, again, first question right here. Sorry, uh, my name is, uh, some people know me, uh, my name is Dan Potts and uh, I was educated at uh, what's considered the world's number one freshwater fisheries school at Auburn University, surprise, surprise. Uh, but it didn't take me long before I got sucked into the depths of the ocean and it wasn't long before I co-authored a book on deep sea fishes in the northern Gulf of Mexico. So I guess my question is, do we suspect, because deep sea fishes are just basically existing on stuff raining from the surface down to the bottom, uh, are, are these, do we think that these coral reefs, the die off of these coral reefs are, are gonna dramatically affect even the fishes in the very depths of the ocean? It's a great question. Um, it goes a bit beyond my expertise, but I can answer it as best as I, as I can. Um, I think the most critical thing there is that coral reefs are the nursery of the ocean. They're considered the no nursery of the ocean. They support about 25%, uh, tw about 25% of everything in the ocean spends part of its life cycle on a coral reef. So will there be consequences? Quite likely. Um, what they will be, we don't quite know yet. Um, that house of cards analogy that Ove referenced before, if you remove the house of cards, uh, if you remove the card that is the coral reef card, um, how does the house adjust itself? Will it resettle into a different structure? Uh, I think that that's the hope, um, more so than completely collapsing. Um, but the implications directly on deep sea fishes, I'm not 100% positive. Um, but I, my gut would certainly anticipate that there would be something like that. All right, we have another question right here. So there are obviously lots of struggles that you had. What was the what was the biggest struggle for you, and what was your biggest success? Um, biggest struggle for me was the, when when the cameras weren't working. It wasn't just that the cameras weren't working, but we that was that was like the climax of the film, and so there was a big chunk of time where we didn't know if we would actually have a movie or not. Um, that was difficult. <laughs> Uh, trying to validate to our team and our supporters, yes, we still need to keep going forward. Yes, this is, uh, you know, a worthy cause. Um, but having that question and that doubt in the back of your mind, uh, is this going to work or not? Are we going to get the images that we're trying to get? How long is it going to take us to get the images we're trying to get? Um, so that was a huge, huge struggle. I would say on the, on the positive side, the, the response to the film has been beyond anything we could have imagined. Um, it's just been really, really impactful, um, and audiences keep coming up to us. And uh, whether it's in person or on social media, um, we we know that the film is having an impact. We know it's getting out there. We know it's reaching new audiences, and that's one of the big hopes for us is that this film can get out there and reach new audiences. Um, so it's been just a very fulfilling to work on. Okay. While well, other people are coming down to uh, ask questions, uh, let me ask you one. In the meantime, uh, you had a great success. You and James Baylog had a great success and raised a lot of consciousness with Chasing Ice. And while this film isn't a sequel per se, it does bear strong similarities stylistically, thematically, and structurally. As you embarked on this particular project, what was your approach? How did you determine what aspects of the process you wanted to follow again that worked so well mm -hmm. with Chasing Ice? And yet, how did you want to make this movie be its own thing? That's a really great question. Um, I, we didn't really try, we were trying to avoid calling it Chasing Coral. Um, we didn't want to call it that. We avoided that for a long time. We, we always just referred to it as the Reef Project. Like that's the company name. That's like, uh -huh. that's everything. The checks go out from the Reef Project. Um, but uh, it's it was... Um, so we, we weren't trying to make it a reflection of chasing ice by any means. 
Um, but at the same time, throughout the entire process, we knew that we're trying to do a sensibly a similar thing, um, trying to document changes happening on the planet, following a team of people that are doing that, needing to learn about the ecosystem at the same time. Um, so there are a lot of similarities, and that's that's why we did end up um, titling it uh, with a similar structure. Um, I think ultimately the biggest lessons learned in working on Chasing Ice, um, well, for me, Chasing Ice was film school. That's how I learned how to make, that was the first feature that I had done. I'd done shorts before then, but that was the first big project. And uh, with this one, I felt like I knew what I was wanting to do with it, uh, certainly to a much better degree than last time. Um, so with this project, really the challenge was um, how do we show, how do we emotionally show the changes happening to the ocean and to this ecosystem? How do we do it in a way that works for all audiences, regardless of whether or not you may or may not think climate change is real, um, which side of the political spectrum you might be on, um, wanting the film to resonate hopefully with, with all audiences, um, and doing it in a way that's um, emotionally compelling and letting the story uh, shine out uh, and come first. Um, so a lot of the insights and a lot of the answers to those questions, I think, were informed by uh, the process that we went through with Chasing Ice. Um, and ultimately, a lot of it just comes down to the visual storytelling. Like when when the time lapses are playing, we don't need to explain them. We don't like there's tiny, tiny little lines being added to it. Um, but hopefully the pictures do the work. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's really one of the things that we've found to be very effective. Um, in uh in just sharing this the story of our changing planet we're not trying to preach we're not trying to shove statistics down people's throat we're not trying to push a political agenda we're just trying to show hey look this is what we've seen happen and this is what's going on and we have to acknowledge that and and figure out how do we want to respond to that what do we want to do thank you we have another audience question right here yes please go ahead okay Hi, first of all, um, Hello. Um, my question is, so I've always had like this soft spot for the ocean, me and my sister, and I've always watched a lot of documentaries on like sharks and all this other things, but I've always wanted to like, like go down and like see it for myself. So like, how would you like recommend me getting involved with like saving Pearl and Nicole and things like that? Because you know, I love sharks and you know, all this other stuff. So just... Go move to Hawaii. And <laughs> and nobody can complain about that part. Um, no, um, it's a it's a really really great question. There's no easy simple solution, and certainly not um, not an easy one being in Utah. The funny thing is that you know I'm I'm based in Colorado. Our team is all based out of uh, out of Colorado. Um, we don't have places in Colorado to go scuba diving. So actually, one of the best places. When people are in Colorado wanting to learn, they actually drive to Utah to go in one of those craters or lakes or something. I don't even know what it is, but it's like this deep. Go um, diving. So that's a uh, that's a way to get involved and and first get your get yourself a uh, scuba, scuba certification. Um, once you have your scuba certification, you can go to a lot of these places and go see it. Um, there are countless organizations working on this. Um, you know, that's one Google search away. I would just send, you know, spend a half hour searching Google and, and finding what organization resonates with you. You know, the ocean is a very, very big place and people are working on sharks, people are working on whales, on turtles. You can go to the ecosystem level, you can go to the species level, um, you know, find a local university and, and find some scientists who are working in different fields and what they're working on and, and figure out a way to, to get involved through, through university. Um, there are really countless things. If you're interested in corals, in the United States, the best places are in Florida and Hawaii. Um, and there are great research institutions in, in both of those states. Yeah, my question is, when you were developing and conceptualizing the film, did you intend for, uh, for Zach to be a main character and to capture oh. his reaction? Um, during the time lapse process, or did that kind yeah. of reveal itself over the course of the filmmaking process? Yeah, great question. It, it definitely revealed itself. Um, we, uh, when you're going into a doc, you're often looking for where are the various storylines. 
there are so many more people and topics and interviews that we did where we were shooting lots of different stories. And you don't necessarily know how all of those stories will sort of funnel down to your main story. Um, so in the process, we shot lots of different things and we were capturing Zach as he was dealing with the, the first round of troubles and complications with the cameras. The very first trip that we did in the field together was the trip that uh, he had to jump in with the case and it got flooded. So when that happened, it was like, okay, let's keep filming Zach more. And can Zach come on more trips? And can we spend more time with Zach? And, um, and then as we got deeper and deeper into production, it became clear that he had such a, a personal relationship with the story and, and with corals. Um, and it only really, it only became clear to me how much of a role he was going to play when we were out there in Australia documenting the bleaching itself. And, and when we were there watching the corals die and his, it was his emotional response. It was him being there and doing it every day. Um, that's where it became clear how strong role he could play in the film. And, um, and fortunately, if you are shooting all of the various storylines when you're starting the, a project and you're being open to those opportunities, um, when you're at the end and you're editing, you have those assets to work with. Um, had we not shot Zach at the beginning, had we not had the footage of him in the labs uh, working, the footage of him in the Bahamas and, and checking the camera and seeing the failures of the first cameras, had we not had all that footage, it would have been much, much harder to make the whole story work. Um, so it's one of those things where we're so glad, like that's where the foresight paid off um, around capturing all those little moments throughout the production. Another question right here. Hi, um, I'd love to get your thoughts on the uh, ongoing research in uh, genetic modification. I know the Smithsonian Institute yeah. one is doing research uh, to create a super coral. Uh, how viable an option do you think that is for reseeding with the time frame fit within that four year span that they're uh, projecting yeah. now? Yeah, really great question. Um, let me take a step back and first address sort of the, um, the I think, a main point before getting to your specific question. Um, the coral reef community is at a stage right now where everybody is exploring any and all options on how to keep corals on the planet. Um, they are exploring uh, genetic modification and selective breeding. They're exploring reseeding, growing, cultivating corals, growing them manually, um, planting them back in the ocean. Um, there are some uh, rather out there ideas as well, one of which called um, marine cloud brightening. And there are actually scientists working on, can we create artificial clouds to go over a coral reef to provide shade over the coral reef so that during the summertime, it doesn't reach a, a really, really high temperature like that. Um, that's an actual legitimate question that scientists are posing right now. Um, will that do enough to, to keep the ocean cool? Um, my personal stance on it right now is we need all of the above. We need to figure out all of these things. Um, so some of the selective breeding work that's being done, the question is, can we breed the corals to be more resilient to temperature and to acidity? And can we kind of prepare them for future conditions? And if we can then do that, can we then replant in the ocean and can we do that at scale? to be viable. That opens up a lot of different challenges. Um, and can you replant the whole Great Barrier Reef with big biodiversity? Uh, you know, that, that would be a really, really big challenge. We're talking about like replanting the Amazon. So that's not an easy feat. But uh, some of the work that Reese, uh, Richard's working on right now in the 50 Reefs program that uh, is referenced at the end of the film, um, there was a lot of thinking around, we need enough to survive we need seed banks. We need places where the corals can survive that we can then let nature heal itself. And corals can respawn. They, they spawn. They do, they do this annual spawning event. And you can go to a coral reef and at a certain time and a certain day with the full moon and the right conditions, all the corals of the same species will spawn. And all of those fertilized eggs will float downstream. And if there's a clean patch of ground for it to adhere to, a new coral can be born there and it can happen in mass 
So there is the ability for nature to solve this and to heal itself if we give it the right conditions. If we get the ocean temperatures to be stable and hopefully at some point to drop down again, um, the coral reefs can come back to full 100% success. Um, it's just a matter of uh, giving it that time. Another question. Mm -hmm. So when you were um, putting down the cameras for the time lapses, were, was it um, any different when they were like interlapping with the new camera stream? Uh, repeat that. Just the last part was it bit, was it more nerve wracking than what? Um, because the cameras filming with the new movie. Ah, mo most of the time I was using the cameras for the movie, being the guy behind the scenes. So that was the easy part. It, whenever when I was in front of the camera, that was the weird part. Um, we this is something where we ended up having a lot of different people with a lot of different cameras always shooting, and at a certain point. When you're so focused on the job and you're so focused on just getting the, the time-lapse cameras to work, you really just forget that there are other cameras there um, and enough people are around with enough camera equipment that hopefully the important things are getting covered. Um, but for me personally, sort of forget about the cameras. Another question right here on the, uh, the left side. My name is George Pat, and I have to admit to all of you, I am a snorkeling addict. <laughs> awesome. I spend almost every winter I can somewhere in the tropics looking at coral and fish. And I spent six winters in Thailand witnessing the, uh, some of the devastation that you've documented here. And I got really depressed after the, the first coral bleaching. And then I came back the next year to my favorite reefs. and it got a little better. I saw some soft coral actually coming back. And then a couple of years later, I saw some hard coral coming back. And I was wondering if you've witnessed this also in other areas. And it's like, it gives me a little bit of hope. At first I was super depressed, like some of your uh, people in your film. And then it gave me some hope that nature can come back if we give it a chance, just like- Absolutely. Mount St. Helens, when it blew up, we thought the forest is devastated, but yet seedlings started to appear after that. So my question to you is, which reefs are starting to come back? And is there also a chance that maybe the reefs will slowly go north, just like the grizzly bears are heading into our Canadian wilderness and breeding now with yeah. polar bears? Yeah. Great question. Absolutely great question. Thank you very um, much. Excellent movie, by the way. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll tackle the second question first. Um, uh, unfortunately, the, the corals can't really migrate. They won't really be migrating to either pole. Um, first of all, they're sort of stuck there physically, so they can't exactly move as fast as a grizzly bear. Um, but separate from that, um, corals really need a lot of different um, conditions to survive. Pretty much everywhere corals live on the planet right now, it's already at one of its thresholds, one of its upper limits. And the main one in terms of why it can't go closer to the poles is because of light. So they need a certain amount of sunlight for photosynthesis to, to, um, to feed themselves. So they can't go farther to those extremes. Um, and the other concern is the topography of the land underneath the water. So the bathymetry of the, of the surface of the ocean is critical in terms of the depth of, of how deep it is for corals to live. So they're kind of limited in terms of where they are right now. There's no expectation that they will be migrating uh, to any meaningful degree. Um, but to go back to your first question, um, absolutely, this is a reason for hope. Um, I haven't been back to the site that we documented in the film uh, that was so devastated last year. Um, I'm a, I would hope that it'll look, it'll look two ways it'll look pretty different. One, those branches that you see there, all of those dead branches that are covered with algae, all of those will likely have crumbled. So just picture uh, tree branches that have now died and then all of that starts crumbling and you just have a big pile of twigs at the bottom. Those corals will then crumble. But then the second thing is that hopefully we will see some baby corals start to regrow. Places like little stragglers and survivors will come back. 
and then little small ones will start to be born from that spawning style approach. Um, so we'll see corals starting to come back. It might be a little bit next year, a little bit the year after, um, but I have seen, I haven't seen it personally, but I've seen footage of corals that were devastated by bleaching that 10 years later look pretty healthy and, and strong. Now, all of those corals will just be 10 years old, right? Those corals are not multiple hundreds of years old like we normally see on a reef. So it's not, doesn't have the same biodiversity and the same kind of lived experience that an ancient reef has. Um, so it's sort of a very, very young reef. Um, but like you're saying, yes, this can be a very hopeful thing. We can see them come back. The concern is if the ocean temperatures get too hot, can it bleach the whole thing again in the future? If, if we continue down this current path, that is a big risk. Um, but if we, if we give it the right conditions, if we let it thrive on its own, it can come back and recover. Um, at the risk of sounding like an ostrich with my head in the sand, before...